Just a, a couple of quick thoughts, and uh, guys, we'll get back to the golf. And uh, I, hope you'll, I hope you'll put this on your bag. I think it's, as Stephen might have mentioned, I just think it's a great uh, little witness, and guys will see that on the course and maybe ask you about it. You invite them to church, and uh, we'll just continue to keep leaning in and seeing uh, what the Lord has in store for us. What an incredible day we had yesterday. This room was filled with guys uh, that were out to worship, and uh, Daniel Eddy, who's the commander of... Uh, all of our Navy SEAL teams uh, shared his heart in a very pastoral way. It was incredible. I just want to uh, add a few thoughts, some practical thoughts. And if you have a Bible, grab it with me. And if you need one, our ushers are in the aisles. Hey, here's the deal. We are one of those last and unique churches that still believes in teaching the Bible. How about that? Amen. That's why you're here. Um, so a couple of things I want to share with you, and then, um, uh, then I'm going to skedaddle. I've, I have a migraine. I had a migraine yesterday, and I'm just getting absolutely pounded. I couldn't even read my Bible. I couldn't even. Um, so anyway, um, if I run off stage, you know where I'm going. Bucket, handy, stage, right. Uh, but when we are weak, come on, help me. He is strong. He is strong. Um, I just want, I want to give you, I really, I really feel like it's an important thought and it could very well modify and reshape our present reality in terms of how we're viewing things in going forward as dads, as moms. Um, and it's probably why I'm getting hammered because I don't think the enemy wants you to see this modifying, reshaping of, of maybe how we're supposed to be approaching our present challenges and realities as families uh, with all that's happening uh, here in the world. Um, we got this set of so-called values that's being indoctrinated into our kids through this curriculum and agenda, which is so demonic, absolutely uh, sneaky the way they're getting it in even to a kindergarten-aged child, it's vile. Uh, what's happening, uh, and it's all happening as if they're in charge, and they're not in charge. Uh, let me remind you of a couple of things as you're turning to Jonah chapter 3. Um, light, everyone say light has been given charge over darkness. And I hope and pray that we would never forget that. Darkness has not been given charge over the light. Hey, light is given charge over the darkness and when the light is turned on, the darkness must flee. We need to speak the light. We need to shine the light. We need to, as dads, as men, we need to speak truth at the lies. We need to shine the light in the dark. We need to speak love into hate. We need to speak courage over our kids and faith over doubt and life over death and, and boldness, guys, boldness. To not be ashamed to be members of the team towel. I hope it's more than just something to wipe your club off with. It would be a reminder we're here to serve. And uh, there is an amazing picture in Jonah 3. You got it? Say got it? Okay, throw something in there and turn to Mark 11. Because we'll get there, but i got to set the scaffolding up uh, before we drill down and see that amazing little nugget from the Lord in Jonah 3. Mark 11, Jesus is just sort of like going uh, about his daily routine. Um, verse 12 in Mark 11 tells us that 
The next day when he had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. I love this. To the humanity of Jesus, he, he, he gets what you're going through. He succumbed to every earthly pressure and temptation. He knew what it was like to go without. He didn't just like float around. The humanity of Jesus got hungry. He's hungry on this day. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see perhaps if, if he could find something to eat. And came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. <laughs> he's, he's hangry. Just a little bit, maybe. Not sinfully, but a little bit hangry, I think. He's like, that's it. No, no fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. They're like, ay, ay, ay. And so they came to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple and he began to drive out those who had bought and sold in the temple and he overthrew the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who sold doves. He would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And he taught him and he said, is it not written, my house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of thieves. The scribes and the chief priests, they, they were pretty ticked off that he was moving in on their territory, right? So when they heard it, they sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people astonished at his teaching. So when evening had come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw that fig tree all dried up, dried up from the roots. Peter, remembering it, said, Rabbi, hey, look. Look, check that out. The fig tree which you cursed is withered away. So Jesus answered, look at this. And he said to them, here's the point. Have faith in God. Don't give up on your faith, guys. Things might be withering around you. I get it. We can pull some pretty simple deductions out of the passage we're reading right now. First of all, you don't want to be that tree. Second of all, you don't want to be that temple. You don't want to be missing the intended point and purpose of your life. And he answers the plight of the problem and says to the guys, here's the solution, have faith. Have faith in God. For assuredly, and, and, and here's my big driving point for Father's Day 2021, I say to you, whoever says... So it matters what we say, guys. I say to you, Jesus speaking, I say to you, whoever says, what are we saying? And I know for some of us, our words are few. Drives the wives nuts. Some of us are men of few words. We're the strong, silent types. But what we say, gentlemen, Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. I don't know what your mountain is today. Maybe you have a mountain of a migraine. Maybe you have a, a mountain of other physical ailments or difficulties or, or, or challenges. You know what they are. God knows what they are. But whoever says, whoever speaks faith, have faith, speaking faith into a situation, speaking courage over our kids, Breaking the routine of North County, not just sort of like falling in with how everyone else finds themselves living. I find it wild. So many dads and moms who are wanting their kids to be different, but not raising them different. Say to that mountain, seems so large, seems so huge. No, 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 have, have faith and speak into it. Cast into the sea and doesn't doubt in his heart. And a lot of us do. A lot of us do, guys. Dad, some of us, we really do struggle with doubt. But believes that those things that he, that he what? That he says will be done. He will have whatever he, what? Says. He keeps, he keeps saying it. He keeps saying it as if he's saying to the guys in the room, speak up. Speak faith. Say it more often. Say it more clear over your kids, over your grandkids, over your families. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, 
When you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Hallelujah. That is so, that is so clutch. That is huge. That is, that is awesome. And I think that, guys, that is a little nudge. Let it be. Let it be. Just a loving little nudge, gentlemen, to not be so strongly silent but outspoken, even if that takes you a bit out of your comfort zone. We can't continue to be quiet about what's happening. We can't be quiet dads. Because, let me, let me, just, sort of, let me just sort of sum thing, some things up. Uh, what, what we say is what we yield. I've just tried to sum it up as much as I could onto one condensed slide. What we release is what's returned. Okay, what we spread is what we spawn. What we declare is what we deliver. What we bless, oh, I bless that. What we bless is what we become. And what we profess, come on, say it with me. What we profess is what we produce. Words have weight. Words lead to actions. They weigh enormously in determining your eternal outcome. The seed, the seed, like if I could just have like a a pile of seeds here, like those seeds represent your words and ultimately will determine the, the fruit of your life. They determine the action, ultimately the results, the fruit of our lives. Turn over to Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 12. We're on our way to Jonah. We're heading that direction. In Matthew chapter 12, um, Jesus make, is really, I think, wanting to double down, hammer down, make the same point. In verse 33, he says, either make the tree good, just speaking of fruit and seeds and words and actions and how they weigh enormously. Look at this passage, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 12, 33. Either make the tree good, he's just cursed one in Mark 11. It's like, that, it's like that picture that James gets us you know, into as well as, as to ultimately what becomes of the fruit of our lives. Like you, you know the tree by the fruit. Look at this. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Fruit of vipers. How can you be an evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's all about speech. It's all about what we're saying. It's all about what we're declaring. And almost allowing on this, the dad's day of all dad's day, allowing for there to be a determination in our hearts as dads to speak at a different dimension. I don't mean a, a, a different language, although some of you might have been given that spiritual gift of speaking in a, in a, in a different language. I, I think for all of us included, regardless of the spiritual gifts that are represented throughout the room and course of the weekend, we would be speaking at a different dimension. And you sense that in one another as brothers. That when you connect as fellow believers, you are at a different dimension. That's what Jesus is talking about here. A good man, verse 35, out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account in the day of judgment. Bob, that's exactly why I don't say very much. Okay, I I get it, I get it. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. It's just showing the enormity and weight and power of our words. And I know all of us, let me just speak for all of us, and all of us at times in our lives wish we could regret what we said. Come on, admit it. In church, yeah? Amen? Amen. We regret, wish I could just hit rewind on that. 
And yet you have this Lord who is abundant and gracious and merciful and kind and able, not in our own abilities, but through what he has accomplished on our behalf to to wash away all of the grime and the gunk and the filth and the regret of things that we have said, of things that we have spoken. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out the enormity of what Jesus is getting at as he repeatedly throughout Scripture continues to bring this to light, the importance and weight of our words. And I know there's rocket scientists here, so I'm always sort of like, you're an intimidating crowd. There's actually rocket scientists in this church. But you don't have to be one to realize that what we're professing is what we're producing. Did y'all, did y'all get that this morning? Words matter. We're all multidimensional in this whole deal. I mean, there's, there's, there's guys with much more smarts in the room right now than I happen to have. I'll do my best to sort of explain this, but they could explain it so much better. They're, they're, they're like, there's this, for the most part, a four-dimensional approach to life in this space-time continuum. Now, there's some in the room that would want to just stop me right now and convince you that there are like 27 different dimensions. Let's just stick with the simplistic route and say there's four, there's length, and there's height, and there's width, and there's time on your, on your four-dimensional space-time continuum, of how you get from one place to another based on length, height, width, and time. Let's add a fourth. Let's add a fifth. That as believers, there's a new dimension that we are invited into where, where our speech patterns are concerned, where our behavior is concerned. And the fifth dimension, more than a band in the 60s. Remember those guys? You have length, height, width, and time. And your fifth dimension is his presence. His presence in your words, in your life, in in your actions, in your behavior, in your seeds, in, in, in your fruit, in what you're producing. He is your fifth dimension. And if you're ignoring that and just living in the four, the four that come naturally... And you're, you're, you're ignoring or denying this fifth, this spiritual dimension. Let me just tell you, something's going to fill that fifth space. Something's going to sit in that fifth seat. Someone's going to step up. Someone's going to speak in. Someone's going to take the stage. Someone's going to grab the mic. And you don't have to have a mic to minister to your family. But where voice is concerned, we now have this fifth dimension of allowing our voice to be his voice and when it's his voice it's so obvious and when it's our voice instead of his voice it's so obvious boy when it's his when it's his word listen every day we have this opportunity as 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 the fine men and leaders that you are in this community, as the moms, as the wives, as, as, as the growers of your home and businesses, to either allow our voice to be his word, led by his spirit, or whether we're going to rely on our own devices. Or even dig ourselves into a deeper hole, into further trouble, and yield our voice to the voice of the enemy. Now, that, I don't know, that might, for some, seem to be very, very simplistic. For others, you might be, like, struggling with it as if it's way over your head. So it's just start simple. What are you saying? What are you going to say today? Don't get all religious on me either. It's the last thing God wants. Just start with what you know to be true and speak a verse over your children like we did over Blakely. Speak a a word of encouragement over your kids. They might be in a different state today. You just might want to start with three words. God loves you. And just allow that to wash over their life. I love you. I I forgive you. How about about this? On Father's Day, this would be a really good one. Jesus speaks about it a lot. I'm messed up. Forgive me. Start with the basics. 
as we begin this new chapter, new opportunity, new, new day, new season, to just declare what we declared in worship. I am no victim. As much as the enemy wanted, just like convince me of that on a daily basis, oh, this and that, you know, and if this would have happened differently, and if that would have happened, and oh, wow, I am no victim. I'm a child of the Most High. set free and redeemed and filled with an everlasting joy. Great are you, Lord. Did you declare that in worship? Some of you might have missed out on that. You came in a little late. Just say it right now. Say it with me. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. Didn't we just sing that? So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. Something's going to be poured out. Something's going to come out. Here's an example. Remember in, in, the, in the story of David and Goliath? It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And every morning, they wake up to what? They wake up to this enemy spewing venom and poisonous negative words over the camp of the Israelites. Every day they wake up to this. And some of you are like, that's my childhood, man. That's what I woke up to. And may that just like forever be rid from your memory. Because David comes on the scene and he doesn't come on the scene as king. He comes on the scene with a towel. He comes on the scene as his dad. He's already been anointed as king by Samuel. But here he comes on the scene as Jesse, his dad, has instructed him just to go check on his brothers. Just to serve his brothers with a little bit of bread and a little bit of cheese. See how they're doing on the front lines. And as he comes on the scene, he is dumbfounded by the fact that daily they're inundated by this guy who just spews negative words that wash over the whole camp to the extent you can read it. I mean, you know this story. You know the story of David and Goliath. But the whole lead up to it is so amazing in the sense that David comes on the scene and he can't believe how fearful they are just of the words that are being spoken from the opposite side of the valley. They are frozen in fear. They are paralyzed. And David's like, you guys aren't saying anything? You're not going to speak up? You're not going to and they, they couldn't. It was just like the cat had their tongue. And they just let that spewing continue without speaking up, without addressing it, without speaking into it. And David just finally said, enough of this. And as Jesus would declare, as we've just seen, both in the Matthew passage and the Mark passage, he just in faith spoke into the situation. I love that, guys. That's who we got to be today because there are giants in this land. The problem starts a lot earlier than the whole issue with David and Goliath. It starts at the very beginning. It's like Page one, right out of the gate. Who was the first strong, silent type of them all? It's Adam. Talk about a guy who is allowing, you know, it's, it's like, he's just like going along with the stupidest plan on the planet. And, 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 and silently letting the serpent do all the talking. Like the camp of the Israelites, stunned and frozen in fear and paralyzed because they're allowing Goliath. And I get it, like all of his gargantuanness, there's like, let him do all the talking. And yet, light has been given charge and authority over darkness. We speak light, we speak faith, we take the lead in situations like that, and darkness has no choice in the matter. So look at Jonah 3. Jonah chapter 3 shows for us a modification 
and reshape maybe of how we are approaching our very lives today. And I just leave you with this. In Jonah chapter 3, and we kind of touched base a little bit on this last weekend. But I missed sharing this with you, and I just wanted to circle back and make sure that, that this point was, I, I hope, just, just hammered home uh, in our hearts. Chapter 3, look at verse 1. It says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Now, that's going to already throw some of you for a loop because it is the capital of sinfulness on the planet in that day. And yet God doesn't come and say, go to Nineveh, that heathen hellhole. He actually calls it a great city. And I looked the, the word up great, and great doesn't mean like just massively large. It means great. Isn't that great about God? He doesn't really limit us based on how we might in the moment happen to be, but sees our potential of who we can become, who we are in Christ. That's great. Because that's who they're about to become. They're about to be fully transformed from being a hellhole into the holiest city in the world because of what's about to take place. He's already told them once, I want you to go, and Jonah's like, I ain't going. I'm the strong, silent type. I'd rather surf in Spain. Where's the boat? Goes to Spain, and the Lord has to kind of come along in the form of a large whale, gobble him up. Now he's been spewed out on the beach at moonlight. <laughs> Steps out of the whale, sort of wipes off some of whatever was on him, and... and Gives the shortest sermon in the book. What's he, he's, he's, here's the sermon. What's it say? Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach it, the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. And Nineveh was exceedingly great city, three-day journey in extent. See, I think, again, it could have said exceedingly sinful, heathen, Vegas kind of. No, it's just a great city. God sees the potential of what we can become if we would just surrender. Three days journey. Three days always stand out to me in Scripture. You know why. So Jonah began to enter the city the first day's walk, and he cried out and he said, here's his sermon. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Amen. <laughs> like, that's it. But that's enough for this response. And here's what we got to see. What's the response? Verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Didn't take a long sermon. It took a willing heart who had courage to stand up as a beacon of light in the midst of sinful darkness. And simply proclaim in his words, hey, hell is hot, forever's a long time, just here to help. You might want to reconsider your deeds. And that was enough for the people of Nineveh to believe God and proclaim a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king. Everyone, just say, say then. Then, what happens first? See, I think usually, and here's how it is in Scripture most of the time, usually the people would follow the king whether the king's good or bad. And a lot of times in Scripture, they're following bad kings and they go right down the drain. Most times, the usual pattern is the people follow the leadership of the king. In this case, did you notice the difference? This is what I think modifies and reshapes our present reality because in this, king, the, in this case, the king follows the leadership of the people. 
The example set forth by the people brings the king to a place of humility. The king of Nineveh came, the word came to him, and he arose from his throne. He laid aside his robe. He covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. He became a member of the towel team instead of the royal entourage. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and the nobles, saying, let neither man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything, and don't let him eat anything, drink water. He was like totally into it, but he was into it because of the example set forth by the people. Now, this is amazing. That word for people in verse 5, you know what it means? 564 times in Scripture, it's the word Enosh. You know what it means? It means men. Sorry, ladies, I don't mean to be sexist, but it is Father's Day. It means guys. 564 times in Scripture, there are only 24 examples where it's miscellaneous. In other words, gender neutral. So 540 times, it's speaking to dads. It's speaking to guys. It's speaking to men. Those are the people that clued in to the message being delivered by God through Jonah The time is short. And I think we are living at a day where we're expecting the change to happen at the top. When we've just done a series together in the church of hearing God say over and over again for five weeks, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and speak these things into what seems to be perpetually and eternally dark. I get it, and sinful, and yet, if we will, God could take what is broken and make it great again. I believe that with all my heart, guys, and he wants to use you to accomplish it in Jesus' name. We're not led from the top down. We are led from a work that God does from the ground up. It happens in the case of every seed that is buried The seed that then determines the yield. What's spoken is what's spawned. Don't be silent. Someone's going to fill the silent space. So I believe we are being called by God's word to be the men that are speaking into the situation, that are speaking up, that are saying enough of this evil. I know a lot would want to speak into situations to see God glorified in their marriages, to see God glorified in their families, and it really comes down to picking up the towel and having a servant's heart. Do you remember the guy? There's one guy who actually begins to speak. He speaks out. He speaks up. He's speaking in Luke chapter 12, and he's speaking in such a way that Scripture describes him as being quite a nut job. Because here's what he's saying. He's saying, saying, and I'll speak to my soul, and I'll say, soul, you have Lots of houses and garages and barns and, yeah, but it's not enough. I'll tear down the barns that I have and I'll make bigger barns. And instead of picking up the towel, he's just speaking into his own circumstance as if he is the center of the entire universe. Compare that to the woman with the issue of blood, who for 12 years, for a dozen years, has been looking for a remedy and she has paid out through every medical practice you can possibly imagine. And finally, the Bible says to us that she says to herself, what are we saying to ourselves? Because some of us are feeling rather beat down and defeated by everything that's happening around us as if we don't have any control and we've been given the authority. We have the sword. We have the light and darkness must flee. And she, in her humility, says to herself, what's she say? If I could just touch the hem of his garment, it would be enough to make me well. Guys, that's all you need is that little bit of a mustard seed of faith. That much. And that's why we sing. That's why we worship. That's why we gather together to encourage our hearts. We used to sing songs like, do you remember the song we grew up singing? Let the weak, what? Say, let the weak, Say, speak into the weakness. Speak it, proclaim it. Let the weak say, I am strong. I rebuke you, migraine, in the name of Jesus. Let the poor say, I am rich. Declare it in faith. Believe it in faith. 
Are you still in Jonah? Come on out, Stasi. We're going to sing together. I think we should. But, um, oh, come on up. If you're in Jonah, just turn like seven pages to the left. Let me wrap up as Hosea wraps up. Look at the end of Hosea. Look at chapter 14. Hosea chapter 14. Would you stand with me as we read this? Let's read this together. This is the very end, the tail end of the book of Hosea. And I think it's part and parcel really of what's now happened in Nineveh because of what Jonah was faithful to speak. And I love this. I love this. In Hosea 14, look at it. It says, Oh, Israel, return to the Lord your God. Guys, that would be your best move on Father's Day. Be men of the towel. He girded himself with a towel. He says to us in Ephesians chapter 5, this is what you should be speaking over your wife. This is what you should be speaking over your family. This is what you should be texting out to your kids. Songs and hymns and spiritual songs and verses. And here's how Hosea puts it. Return to the Lord your God, for you've stumbled because of your iniquity. But take words with you. What we say matters, gentlemen. And men, I pray that your words would be seasoned with salt, gracious words of encouragement and love and grace and faith. Take words with you and return to the Lord and say to him, say to him what? Say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously for we will offer the sacrifice of our lips. It might be a sacrifice. It might be easier, I know, just kind of in your natural DNA to remain silent. But make it a sacrifice of your lips. For Assyria shall not save us. Sacramento ain't going to save you, guys. D.C. ain't going to save you. Assyria won't save us. We will not ride on horses. Some will trust in horses, some in chariots. We will trust in the name of the Lord our God. We will say, we will not say any more to the work of our hands. You're our gods. For in you the fatherless finds mercy. And I will heal their backsliding and I will love them freely and my anger will be turned away from them. This is so good, guys. And I'll be like dew to Israel and they shall grow like the lily and lengthen the roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be like an olive tree, not cursed, not withered like the fig, but like an olive and his fragrance like Lebanon. You know when Solomon built that temple? Which God then, as we saw in the Reset series, comes and speaks and says, I will fill this temple with my presence and fire falls. You remember that last weekend? Fire fell and the fire has fallen for us in Acts chapter 2. When they built that temple, they had to go to Lebanon to get the lumber. Because Israel, for the most part, is a pile of rocks. Have you been there? There's a lot of rocks. And they had to go to Lebanon because Lebanon is known for its cedar, the cedar of Lebanon. You got cedar in your closet? Some of you, I you do. And you're like, oh, the cedar, the cedar and the, ah, curse to the moth. May that be the fragrance of your speech. May that be the fragrance of your life known like the fragrance of the cedars of Lebanon, of the vineyards of Lebanon. Look what it says. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Now I'm not a drinker, but that sounds really good this picture of us once half filled crusty old water pots that by the miracle of Cana the very words spoken by Jesus we become the greatest tasting wine guys let that be your fragrance may the presence and peace and grace and love of Jesus Christ 
be your cologne that fills your life and house and room with his love and his forgiveness, with his joy and his grace, both now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen.